Welcome to the podcast. I am Shane Barker, your host of Shane Barker's Marketing Madness Podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking all about Instagram strategy, Instagram jail, and everything related to Instagram. My guest, Jen Herman, is globally recognized for being an Instagram expert and a forefront blogger on Instagram marketing. She's a founder of Jen's Trends and author of Instagram for Dummies and also works as a social media strategist, speaker, and consultant. She's also a mom to a beautiful baby girl and a collector of stilettos. Listen as she talks about Jen's Trends and discover all you need to know about Instagram marketing. Well, cool. So once again, excited about having you on the podcast. Obviously, the topic this last week and last two weeks has been the coronavirus and all that fun stuff. We're going to talk about marketing. Not that we can't dip into coronavirus if that happens, right? And what we've got going on, how it ties into marketing. But I was excited about having you as a guest. Obviously, we're talking about having you on for a few months. I don't, you didn't know that. Yeah. We invited you. but And so we're excited about having you. I have... The questions that we sent over, that's not, I mean, that's just kind of some of the ways that we go. Sometimes we yeah. go this way. I mean, I've literally recorded one five days ago. We didn't talk about marketing at all. And it was all about psychology, which I do not have a degree in psychology, but I guess I've, awesome. I've dealt with enough people to understand to have somewhat of a, a cordial conversation about it. So anyway, so I'm excited about having you today. We'll talk about Instagram, all the fun stuff you've got, your books, yeah. all the, you know, we'll get into it all. I guess first and foremost, how are you doing? Is everything going good with you? Yeah, things are good. It's, every day gets a little bit better. Monday was really bad. Tuesday was horrible. Wednesday was manageable. Thursday, I survived. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like every day we're, you know, a step closer to getting through this. It's been fine. I actually have my day job yeah, still. Anyway. So, and I'm director of communications for an aerospace company that has government contract as our customer. So I'm a little busy right now, <laughs> just like constant communications to all the employees, trying to stay on top of everything. So it's definitely been like, usually Friday, I don't do anything. And I have been going since 630 this morning. Like it is just like, what is happening? But things are good. I'm good. She's good. Everybody's fine. It's just adjusting to the unknown, which for me is really hard to do. Yeah, I think it's hard for everybody, right? It's like, how do you like, it's just so crazy. Because like every day, you're just there's a new thing that's happening or going on or that you've got to do or not do or be careful, don't do this. It's just when it's like by the hour, like I will literally turn off my phone and go have dinner and I come back and I'm like, what just happened? Like literally that quickly things can change. Well, and you're, you're in San Diego, right? Yeah. 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 I'm in Sacramento. So we, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, especially in California now that we've got this and that and updates yes. and you got to do this and not do that. And you can yeah. stay go at out. home in place yeah. and all these things that like, yeah, literally last night, like, cause my boyfriend was over yesterday, you know, went for lunch or well got lunch and ate it here. Cause we can't go out. Yeah but just hung out for a couple hours and he went home and he's in charge of, he's the global risk officer for a massive company or worldwide. They have like offices in 16 countries. So he's been dealing with this for yeah. since December. Oh yeah. But we were literally like all of a sudden last night at eight o'clock, we're like, Oh, well apparently we're locked in our houses now. <laughs> like, so of course he started disseminating like what the stay at home like mandate meant and what it means. Cause that's also his job. Yeah, so, for sure. but it was crazy that like within hours of him being here, we're all of a sudden we're like, so we can't leave our houses. We can like, it yeah. was so confusing and just, it does change so quickly right now. It's crazy. Yeah. Cause we've never been mandated like that. Right. Like, I mean, there's like, you get these little things of recommendations of what you should do right. before all of this. You right? should I stay get home. It. Yeah. Like just be cautious. I'm like, Oh yeah. I'll wash yeah. my hands twice today. It's no big right. deal. And now it's like, you know, stay inside or we're going to find you. Not really. It's not really that way. But I did. I read it as well. And I had before I read it, I had friends that were like, oh, my God, you can, we'll get cited and find. And other people are like, no, it's not. I mean, it's there. You know. Yeah. And they're not going to enforce it. I think at any point, like like even like with my daughter and exchanging custody with her dad, I'm not going to not take her to her dad's and I'm not going to not go pick her up. That's an essential service. 100%. And no one's going to find you. No, for doing no, no, no. Those types of things. They just don't want you going places that you don't need to go. And it's also really to, you know, because this is the first time this has ever happened. It's also to deal with them. I'm going to call them knuckleheads, but the people that really haven't, like, yeah. aren't taking it seriously, right? Those are just for yeah. like, hey, listen, we're not going to find you. But at the end of the day, this is very serious. And they just can't, well, you, yeah. I don't know if you saw the stat they came out with yesterday. Of course, when this podcast comes out, it'll be late news, but about 50% <laughs> of the people of California are going to have it. Yeah. That's what, yeah, they were predicting. Yeah. So I'm like, so Newt's and what's anyways, so we're, we could go down this. We could talk about this for an hour, which we might, who it's knows, <laughs> but it, it's just, it's just crazy when you hear that kind of information. It's like, man, you protect yourself in your, your little bubble or whatever it is. And I mean, it's only been five days and I'm just, I literally had a, not a meeting, but it was a friend of mine. I was like, Hey, let's, what do you want to like? I'm going to have a beer. You want a beer? Yeah. So we lit, we put on zoom, like we jumped on zoom, yeah. put up on my camera and we're having a beer and chatting and doing this. And 
it was fun, yeah. but I was like, man, you got to kind of get used to this. You know, we are obviously on video stuff all the time. We call it wine and Zoom because all of us girls will get together for a bottle of wine over Zoom. And we've actually been doing this for months because there's a group of us friends that are all around the US and this is how we get together. So now it's kind of funny because now it's like, well, we've been doing this for a while. So should we like do more of them, less yeah. of them? Like we're like, it is a great way to connect. I'm not a doctor, but I would recommend more wine. <laughs> I mean, that's just what I'm saying. You know, and that's an essential trip. I'm out of wine. I have to go get more of wine. <laughs> I honestly, if you would have had me on your podcast, I would have just left and said, listen, I got to go get beer. Like there's nothing, we, it's nothing personal. Like I would love to talk right. to you. We got to go. But there's, I mean, there's, there's necessities in life. Those are one of those things. So it's, I think yeah. it goes, I think it's food, it's shelter, and then wine and beer. I think is the yeah. other one. I don't even know if it's in that order. I think there's certain people. Right. That, that it may things. switch depending on the day. <laughs> well, that was the funny part. Like I went out and we went to Costco. And once again, I wasn't going to talk about this, but we'll just keep going. Yeah, it's fine. When I went to Costco, like this was before Trump had said his thing on Friday. So everybody, this was actually, no, this was right after. It was like an hour after. And so my wife and my wife works nights. So she just woke up and it's like, oh, what's going on? And so I was like, hey, let's go. So we went over to Costco and people were losing their minds, grabbing toilet paper and all this. And there was like no water. And everybody's like losing their mind. And I'm like, I mean, I got to be honest, it really is just hitting the fan. Like, it's really, this is, you know, I'm like, I'm grabbing beer. Like, I'm Irish. Right, exactly. so like, I'm like, really? You guys want to go Water, out Yeah, I'm like, no. I said, at the end of the day, it really goes down. You're going to be like, hey, I'll trade you a few things of water for that beer. Because I just, I got to kind of get to this other place that I need to be right now. Legit. Yeah. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm already there, brother. Like, I don't need water. What do you need water for? Like, on um, the other thing was, was toilet paper, which I thought was, to me, was entertaining the, um, the stuff. I'm like, you do understand that if you don't have food, you don't need toilet paper. Like you understand that process, right? Like how it, it gets right? filtered through your body and, but you know, it <laughs> like is. Like you know why is. you need it, right? And mm -hmm. you know how much like, you go through. Like yeah. it's me and my daughter, like one case of toilet paper will last us three months. Yeah. Like I'm like, we don't need 20 cases no. ever. No, 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 no. You won't be buying toilet paper for the next five years. They're going to have like pantries to fall over the next, yeah. like yeah. rest of their lives. It's well enough. Obviously the other side of it is, is like, you know, Hey, just take enough for your family for a month. Month. You know, you don't yes. really need to grab. And there was a lot of people and people that I know that have babies at the toilet paper, they didn't have toilet paper. And then all say they took the wet wipes. And so it's like, how yeah. do you, so, you know, that kind of stuff is like, I get it. People get worried. Am I worried? I'm not worried. I'm cautious and want to say educated, um, yes. but it is kind of like, you know, but you get more news and you got to kind of like, I just went on a walk before I did the podcast, probably illegally. Now that I think about it, I'll probably get fine. No, it's, it's totally really... fine to go out in your neighborhood. As okay. long as you're six feet apart from other people. <laughs> it, it was, I, I made sure that I had my bubble. I actually kept my hands out and I said, I have, right? I said, I love Corona was my shirt that I wore. No, I'm totally kidding. I did not do that because that would be terrible. But it was, uh, I live across the street from a park and there was, there's people out in the, yesterday in the park playing Frisbee doing this. And I yeah. Thought, you guys got to take it one level closer to be like being a little more cautious because the issue is if you don't stop, we're talking about, you know, flattening the curve, right? If you don't yeah. stop what you do, the problem is, is, and you could be that conduit and people don't exactly. really understand that. And so it's, we just have never dealt with anything like this. This is all, you know, oh. I took, do you know, Mark Schaefer? Yeah. Yeah. So I just had a, I did a kind of talk with him yesterday, just on the podcast, but you know, and talking about just this and just how it's like, we kind of talked about like, how do you deal with this? You know, as a marketer, more of yeah. like humans and people. Right. And I think what we really came up with at the end of the day is like, I think this is going to bring, we might at the beginning stages, but I really hope this brings people closer as humans, right? Of like, you know, it's like great. Like I talked about this yesterday. It's like two of my biggest clients quit on me, like literally like within oh. 24 hours and, um, or maybe it was 48 hours, but either way it felt like it was like yeah. getting punched in the face over and over. And I did a call with yeah. them and, and it wasn't to retain them. I was like, what can I do for you guys? Like, it's less about the money and more about like, how are you guys doing? Cause they're yeah. obviously dealing with their stuff too. If they have to pull out the rug within you know that kind of timeline. So I hope once again, it's a little early to talk about, Oh, this is all going to be great. Right. Cause we're literally probably not even in the middle of it <laughs> right? in the beginning no, stages. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, at least to keep it a good outlook that there's some some good stuff. I read on one of the musicians that I follow from you know, a while ago and he goes, you know, the really unfortunate part, of course, he had a lot of cuss words, I think, in the middle of this, but I'll, I'll cut <laughs> some of that out. But he's like, the real fortunate part of this is like, hey, we're all going to be locked down for whatever, whatever the amount of time it is. It really sucks. Yeah. But just imagine the music in 2021 because everybody has time to write. Nobody's on the road. And so, you know, yep. it's a little early to say, hey, that's super awesome. I'm like, yeah, in eight months, this is going to be great. But what about the next eight months? What are we going to be doing? Like, <laughs> you're going to be in your house by yourself. <laughs> talking exactly. to yourself. Exactly. Yeah, under medicated with no alcohol. But it will be interesting to see, like, like you said, just in terms of like friendships, like how many more people reach out, even if it's just virtually or over the phone, reach out to people that they wouldn't normally pick up the phone and call. You know, having our kids at home when we're used to having the kids shuttled off to school, we're used to rushing through like dinner and bedtime and homework. And then, you know, oh, we got like a couple hours on the weekend between all the yeah. extracurricular things. Like, 
now you have all this time with your kids. Like, what's that going to do for relationships and parent bonding? And there's like, it could have some really good results in a lot of way. And I think no matter what happens, this will reframe how a lot of us do things going forward in terms of how we set up our schedules, set up our lifestyles. We've gotten so into this like busy, 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 constant activity. And I think this is kind of force people to be like, oh, this whole like chill is not so bad. (laughs) I think so too. I think this is a, a recalibration. And I think whatever people have said, it's mother nature or whatever, but it's a recalibration of how, how you look at time, right? Because I'll tell you right yeah. now, we, everything was great. Two weeks ago, not a problem. We did this and busy, busy, busy. Don't have time yeah. for you. Sorry. Don't have time for family. Don't have this. And then all of a sudden you're like, that can all be taken away. And you're like, exactly. Oh snap. Like, and literally is being taken away. Right. And not in a bad yeah. way, but just protocols. And so now you're in a situation like, God, I really wish I would have had dinner with my mom two weeks ago, which is, that's a lie. Cause I, I literally see my mom, mom like three times a week and go to dinner all the time. But <laughs> maybe my dad's a better example. Like I, you know, right you know, now it's like, I have, I've gotten phone calls from people that I haven't talked to in months. One of my buddies, a, he's a high end jewelry designer and him and my dad and his dad were best friends. And so I, we keep in touch every few years. Like I've He'll see right. me like in a magazine, he'll screenshot and then I'll send him some stuff. Like, you know, and he, he's yeah. doing extremely well, but I talk, he literally talked on the phone yesterday. Hey man, I just want to see how you're doing. And I haven't talked to him in, I don't know how long. So it's That's that awesome. kind of stuff that I'm hoping that that will bring kind of rekindle some relationships because at the end yeah. of the day, you know, I, I think, and you're in the same boat. It's like, we're in the top percentage of people that we have food and we have shelter and yes. we have, you know, good things. And hopefully it doesn't affect our families. Yeah. But, you know, we're also healthy, you know, we're not in this age bracket where you've been smoking. Right, we're at the high risk. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but it is, it is hard. I'll tell you the last five days has been just a little bit of a challenge just in reframing how I think of this, yeah. right? Of like, because it's like, you've, you're in quarantine or you look at it like, guess what? I get to spend time with my family, my friends, and I get to reevaluate things and I get to work on stuff that I normally would be too busy for, right? Yeah. And the other upside too, and I have a, it's a long story, but I have a real estate, I have a to flip real estate too. A lot of people don't know that, but you know, I've looked at this thing and said, you know what, through this whole thing, because I have money in properties, right? Which is awesome right. until they stop everything. Then it's not awesome. Right. Right? <laughs> right? Then it turns not awesome at all. But the thing I, way I look at it is that the only upside is that, not the only, there's other upsides, but what I, the way I look at it is everything stops. So it's not like I had a death in my family and I'm depressed and I just can't get out of bed or something. Like right. It's everybody. So it's not everybody. like you get a hold of the loan guys and say, hey, listen, here's the deal. And they're like, we get it. We'll give you 90 days. Like it's not right. So everybody's yeah. in the same boat. And I think that's going to be interesting just worldwide. And just like I said, everybody becoming less, more like, I guess, compassionate and understanding. And so I'm excited about that phase. I want to get to that phase really soon, like as quickly yeah. as we can. <laughs> and I'm like, can we just hit the fast forward button? Yeah. Let's just, let's just yeah. skip yeah. this whole part and just get there. That's what the beer is <laughs> for. So it just helps me miss a few parts. Of right. I want, I want to just go to the, the days course. a little. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not a habit or anything, <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> no, so I, all good. <laughs> so I black out six hours a night. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> it's not, I wake up fine. <laughs> Nobody's hurt ever for the most part. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, now that we've talked about all the super fun stuff, the coronavirus right? and how we feel about it and our emotions and stuff, I feel like this has been very therapeutic. Tell us a little bit. So you, we do know you're in San Diego. I want to go back a little bit and kind of give us a little premise about you, your upbringing, where you went to college, how you got into your current, what you're doing today, the obviously consulting, all the fun stuff, Instagram. Let's go through that. Like, where did you grow up? You, did you grow up in the San Diego area? No, not at all. I am originally Canadian. So born and raised was actually in a really small town where I was born in like Northern Alberta, where they have six foot snow drifts by Halloween. Ooh. So it was like the town is literally called Cold Lake because it's really cold. <laughs> super sense. creative. Yeah. Super. <laughs> but yeah, I grew up there and lived there for eight years, moved east and lived in Ottawa for a few years. And then I moved to Vancouver Island and lived in Victoria, which that's what I consider home. That's where my friends are. I went to high school. I went to the University of Victoria there. So that's my home base. If I was, you know, to pick a home, that would be it. And then my parents actually retired back to Vancouver Island uh, about four or five years ago. So now they're a few hours north of where I grew up on the island, but they're up there. So now I get to go back and visit and see them and see my friends and do all that whenever I kind of go back that direction. So it's really nice. Nice. I love that. I love it. You're like, I, I used to be Canadian. Kind of like, I, I love that when people <laughs> say that. And I'll say, well, yeah, this person was this. And I'm like, there's still that actually now that I think about it, like they're still Canadian last time I checked, but and so you've been here for what? 17, 18 years, 17 years. So I'm this weird hybrid. I actually, my best friend is Canadian and I have a, obviously a lot of American friends and we always joke that I'm the translator between the Canadians and the Americans. Cause I'm this weird hybrid that like 
understands Canadians mentality and like just a little bit different in terms of upbringing and kind of cultural things. But I also understand the American way and American things that, you know, in general, people will be like, oh, you're so nice and you're so Canadian. And the Canadians are like, oh, you're so Americanized. You're not Canadian anymore. Like I'm this weird, like That's in the middle. <laughs> funny. It's it's like a it's this thing. And this is a terrible analogy, but I think like a mixed child. They're like, I don't know. I'm like, right? I'm, I know I'm black, but I'm kind of I'm not really sure what's going on. It's well, you know, it's funny what I do love. And I'll tell you, there's a number of things I about Canadians, but I do love how nice they are. And I think that's just yeah. the way that they were, they were brought up. It's just a very, like, I mean, I've been to Canada, I've done speaking events there and just the people, anybody that I meet from Canada, I, I automatically think this is going to be a good conversation and this is going to be a nice person, right? Which is probably not yeah. all of everybody, but it's, it's a, the high percentage the vast of the population. Majority. Yeah, yeah. Like are, are cool like that. It's funny. And I, and what's going to proud of being American, but you know, I know that's not always the view I've done a lot of world traveling and that's not always a view when it comes to, you know, Americans. And I've, had to fight some of that, not fight, and that sounds terrible, but very aggressive, but no, of like, right. trying to like, hey, why do you think that? And, you know, sometimes yeah. people are this way or ugly Americans or oh, yeah. military or something like that. But Canadians are like, I just have never, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say something bad about a Canadian. Like that's Well, is, and it's like, I always laugh because, I mean, it really is true. The stereotype that Canadians are the nicest people you'll ever meet is pretty true. And it is like, it's, there's just certain things that are ingrained. I actually did it yesterday. I went to pick up a package from FedEx so I went in, I had to go to the distribution center because I had the door tag. So I went and picked, looked for it here. She had to go look for it there. She's running all around. It took her like 10 minutes to find this package. And the Canadian in me, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for that to turn into a whole, you know, treasure <laughs> hunt for you. And I'm apologizing to her for something that's totally not my fault. That's her job to do it. Like, but that's the Canadian in us. Like we yeah. will apologize for things that are totally not our fault. <laughs> and that lady's ready to call security. She was like, I don't know what she's on, but she just apologized right? for like, me to do this. Way too nice. Yeah. <laughs> there's something fishy going on. She's going to do something. We got to stop her right now. She's <laughs> right? way too nice. <laughs> that's too funny. But that's, that's once again, that's, uh, that's how you were raised. And so I think, yeah, I think that's awesome. I've, I've you had can't nothing. Take that out of you. You know, the, the, when you're like, they're like, Oh, you can take the girl out of the, but you can't take the, the out of the girl. Like, yeah, you can't take the Canadian out of the girl. It's, you don't want to take that it's out. It's still that's, in there. Keep that, keep that. That's something you definitely want to hold on to. So tell us, I mean, I think you kind of already told us an interesting fact that there was the name of your city is literally just cold Lake. I mean, that's where yeah. like, what should we do? It's cold. It's a lake. Let's just kind of put those together literally. and make it, make it happen. <laughs> Any other fun facts about your family growing up? I mean, other than you're Canadian? Well, it was, I mean, it was kind of one of those things where we traveled a lot growing up in the sense that my parents wanted us to see the whole country as much as possible. So we would take summer camping trips. We would always buy car, buy mm. camper van and sleeping in, you know, tents and, and things like that at, at campsites. But we got to see the whole country growing up. And my parents were really big about making sure that we saw more than just what was in our backyard. So I didn't get to travel a lot. We weren't wealthy by any means. And I didn't get to, you know, go to extravagant, amazing places, but I at least got to explore the country. And I always respect that, that I got to see that other part of just like the US, you know, you've got the West Coast versus East Coast yeah. and climates and cultures and all that. So it was always really appreciative that I got to see all that with my parents. So it's funny. So I we was similar in the sense that, you know, we used to do a lot of camping and we would go like here in the, in, in California, like Big Sur and there was Big Basin. There was really just yeah. beautiful, big forests and stuff. So I really, really enjoyed that. And it's funny, I didn't really get bit by the travel bug until I think it was my senior year. Maybe it was a, a year after that. But either way, it was I went to Costa Rica for school, for mm. college. And that's when I really like the Ticos and Ticas, the people of Costa Rica were just absolutely amazing. And the food was amazing. And I actually lived with a family there in Costa Rica and like had no, there was no English spoken. Like the little girl that was, there was three generations in the house that I lived in. And there was like nobody that spoke any English at all. So I like oh for the gosh. first day, I was just like, and my Spanish was not that good. Trust me. Right. <laughs> my first day, I'm just going, oh my God, this is going to be a nightmare. You know, I'm like, how am I going to do this? You know, but that was the whole point, right? The problem is when you go and you're American or anybody and you're speaking English with everybody at your college, like that defeats the whole purpose. Like the idea is to be right. submerged. You're going to learn 10 times faster. So yeah. I just went out there and said, all right, I'm just going to have to start throwing out some words that you guys are going to have no idea what I'm saying. And you guys, you know, all you can say is Figure restroom. I'm going to, I don't know how to. <laughs> say, you know, I know how to say beer and like, you know, like, how are you? And that's, I mean, it was like six words that I had not read. I knew more than that, but still it felt that way. But yeah, yeah. I just, I'm now, now like, I um, haven't seen that family. Obviously it's been 20 something years, but it was a great experience. I mean, ever since then, culturally, when I want to travel, I always want to travel because yeah. of that kind of stuff, like the food and the people yeah. and, you know, you learn so much through that. So anyways, that's kind of cool. So tell us a little bit. So you 
graduate with a biology degree. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So t- this is what I love. This is because it's always like, so I did this, but then somehow I ended up over here. So like, how did that? Hey, what, over here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What were you doing with a biology degree? What was your, what were your goals? So I grew up as a kid, always wanting to be a detective. All right. So I always wanted to solve murder mysteries. And I always read like the Nancy Drew books and all mm. the things and I totally wanted to be a detective. But growing up in Canada, a bazillion years ago, that was not an option. They didn't have crime scene units. They didn't have forensics units. And you had to go through being a beat cop to work your way up to be a detective. And I didn't want to be a cop. So I was like, you, you know guys what? were too nice. That's the problem. You're too we're nice. Way so too nice. And people There's are a, killing each other. Crime. Yeah. Like you got to get to California where we really, we up the ante. Like this is where right? you exactly. be a detective. And that's how I actually ended up here. So <laughs> I, because I couldn't do it in Canada, I was like, I'll go be a veterinarian. That was, I loved animals. I wanted to actually do large animal veterinary. I wanted to work in a zoo or something really cool like that. So I started my undergrad with that full intention of going to vet school. And about two, I think it was probably about halfway through, so about two years into my undergrad, I realized I could move to the States and do a master's in forensic science. Mm. And I was like, sign me up. So I did. So I applied, got into a school here in San Diego. So I pivoted my biology degree to focus back more on to, it was still science and it was still biology, obviously, but a bit more focused towards the criminal type side of things. Finished my degree in my undergrad in biology, moved here to San Diego, did my master's in forensic science, graduated top percentile of my class, was all ready to you know go do forensics and do the things, but life happened. And it's very competitive to get into that industry. It's, you know, people have tenure, they've worked in these yeah. industries forever and they just never leave the jobs. And if nothing opens up, there's no place for you. So in the meantime, I took a sales job and I moved up to Orange County and I was doing sales up there and loved it. And the whole forensics thing just wasn't panning out. Then we had the recession. And at that point, it was like, do whatever you can do to survive. And I went back to waitressing and bartending and then went back to another corporate job. And in that corporate job was where we had to start using Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn to market the company that I work at. Mm. And I fell in love with it and was like, well, okay, this is kind of fun. Like maybe I can do something with this. And working at a company that's all retired military, they were really adverse to open up the curtain, so to speak. Like they didn't want to share what was happening in the company. And they're, you know, very like, keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody what's happening. And so I overcame all of these challenges with them. And in doing so, I was like, well, if I can do this, other people can learn from me. And that was how Jen's Trend started. It was a total hobby blog just to kind of share things that were going on in social media and how people could learn and overcome challenges. And seven years later, now I do Instagram. <laughs> I love it. Isn't it crazy? Just, it's like, that's why, I mean, literally that's the reason why I have this podcast. It's like, just to hear people's story and it's like, how do you get from point A to point? Yeah. Like, what is that journey? You know? And it's always something interesting. Hey, we wanted to do this. We wanted to do that. And then all of a sudden I did this. And then I met this person and this happened and I got a divorce and this, and then all of a sudden this, and all of a sudden here I'm here. And it's like, that's awesome. You know, that's your journey. That is your journey. And that's the thing. I wouldn't change any of it. Like, I'm so grateful for all the things that fell into place in the places they did. Cause I'm like, If anything had been different, if I'd taken a different job, if I hadn't moved when I moved, if I'd worked at a different company, I may never have started Jen's Trends. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I love the things I get to do. So as much as it's this crazy roundabout excursion to get here, I would never change it. Yeah. See, that's the way I've talked about that a lot is like the journey of like, you know, because people have said, oh, you know, what would you change about your, and I, and I go, not really much. Like, I mean, for no. me, this is my journey, you know, and I, I'm in charge of it up to a certain extent, right? I mean, I'm kind of steering the boat and then sometimes it goes this way and that way, but it is what it is. I mean, I, you know, the only thing that I've talked about, and I've actually talked about this in the past is I was early on, if I would have gone to San Francisco early on, like when I went mm-hmm. first, cause I'm, I'm 40, when am I 40? I'm going to be 45, assuming that I make it here in the next few months, but <laughs> God willing. But yeah, the thing is, is I look at that and I go, man, if I would have gotten like right out of like high school, I talked about moving to San Francisco crazy early in the tech scene. And I'm like, yeah. but how would that have changed things? Now, maybe I would have like had more money or something, or I would have probably been bald or fat. I don't know. Like, I don't know what that would have entailed, but I just think yeah. that would have been an interesting time to be in tech, you know, cause I was always in the Sacramento yeah. area, which we were kind of on the, obviously the outskirts of San Francisco. Yeah. So I would go in there and tap in a little bit. And then I would kind of come back to, you know, my normal, not normal life, but I mean, my life in Sacramento <laughs> that, you yeah. know, that I would think was thinking was normal. So how is that transition from Cold Lake to San Diego? I mean, it's pretty much the same climate, right? Totally the same climate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, I know they're Absolutely. called sister cities from what I understand. Right? Yeah. Well, and that was the thing. Like every time I've moved, I've moved someplace warmer. 
So I started like in Northern Alberta, then I went east, then I went west, then I came south. And it was like, I am now the world's biggest complainer. If it drops below 70 mm. degrees, I'm like wool winter coat. And my friends and family back home, of course, make so much fun of me because they're like, uh, this is a balmy spring afternoon. And I'm over here bundled up like we're going to go, you know, fishing in the Arctic. San, Di <laughs> San Diego bit you. That's a San Diego attitude right there. Because oh, everybody's like, legit. man, if it's if it's not between 79 and 80.2, <laughs> yeah, like it's like this. You know, which is awesome. So do you think that you're going to probably move to Mexico or you because of the heat? Or are you just I know you're just going to continue to go down that border. Right, I know. I'm like, I'm running out of options. I'm like, yeah. I've got maybe like Palm Springs, Arizona, if I wanted to kind of head desert ish. It's hot Otherwise, yeah, I'm heading to the equator at this point, And that's the only place yeah. I have left yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah, you're going to slow down these trips here a little bit because you got plenty of time. I just, you know, you just don't want to get to the end real fast because it's going to be hot. Right? It's going to be hot. And if you're anything like me, see, I'm Irish and I have this very beautiful milky white skin that if I see sun anything longer than 17, 18 five seconds. Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you, thank you for saying five minutes. But that would have been if I was out there for 36 times in a row and you added all those times up together. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of those deals like my, you know, I'm like, like literally, I, you, nobody can see this, but I'm wearing this red shirt right now. Like literally this would be me tanning. Like I would, right. I would just be red. Like it's, my wife's like, oh, you, are you sick? Are you irritated? Or I'm like, no, this is, this is a tan. This it's is just what me. we do. And she goes, oh, that's cool. Do you have a shirt on or do you not? Oh, it's a red shirt. Okay. Oh, no, you don't have a shirt. Okay, good. Just wondering. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. It. <laughs> this is how we do it. Well, let's talk about a little bit of Jen's trends. Like, so what do you like? Tell us a little bit what you obviously we know kind of how you got there. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about like what you do. And I mean, because obviously mm -hmm. this this goes to like, hey, you were doing Twitter and Facebook and all the other fun stuff. Yeah. And then Instagram, and then you have the Instagram for dummies, and then I'm like kind of go into that whole process of what you did there. Yeah. So when I started the blog, it was Jen's trends in social media. And it was meant to cover things that are like trending, new things, news and features and all that sort of stuff. And I was on all the major platforms except Instagram. Mm. And all my friends were on Instagram and I was like, oh, I don't have time for the social media platform. But I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this blog, I, I have to learn Instagram. Like that's just a reality. This is a trend. This is the direction things are going. And that's what I'm writing about. So I did jumped on Instagram, downloaded the app, started playing with it. And I fell in love with it. Like I just genuinely loved the community, the connection, the interaction. I love photography. I'm not a photographer by any means, but I love photography. So it was a natural fit for mm. me. And I was like, okay, well, this is really cool. So how do I use it for business? And I started Googling and there was nothing. I mean, everything was so superficial, like, like more like content and put up more comments and use more filters. And it was nothing strategic. Yeah. So I was like, well, F it. I got this blog. Like, I'll just start blogging about it. And I did. And it was all those blogs are there. If you dig far enough in the archives, they're all still there. And it was literally, I tried this this would work in this context. This would not be good in this context. Because I have a very strategic mindset and understand all the dis different business applications, applying things strategically. And the more I started writing about it, I was the only one. So I started ranking in Google searches left, right, and center. And all of a sudden, I was like getting podcast interview requests and people started wanting me to speak at events. And I was like, well, okay, apparently this is my shtick and I'm just going to roll with it. And so I was totally not like, I did not wake up one day and say, I'm going to be an Instagram expert. Like it was totally not intentional. It just evolved. And in doing so, I've been very, very blessed to have really good people in my life and in my network who, when they get beta features or when they get early releases in another country, they will go and grab screenshots. They will test it. They will give me access to their account so I can test it. Mm. And then I can write about it, record a video, all those sorts of things. So I continue to kind of be at the forefront of things because people come to me with the things that they trust and, and want to get out there. So it's been an amazing journey to get to where I am. But now I typically speak and do like webinars, podcasts, and teach Instagram marketing. I wrote Instagram for business for dummies, wrote Instagram for dummies. So that's what I'm known for, but working with clients as a consultant and I don't put myself in the coach category, but I kind of help people in a similar way. I do that more actually social media strategy. So I actually come in and help them figure out what their strategy looks like, how to get from you know A to Z, all the things they need to do in the middle, not just on Instagram, but social media in general, and then some of the major platforms as well. Gotcha. So that's, it's cause it is interesting. Cause the whole Instagram thing, I mean, I kind of in the beginning kind of was kicking and screaming a little bit too. And, and <laughs> right. you know, cause it's just like, God, another more, one more thing to manage or create right. content for, or do this or do that. 
but I do, I'll tell you, I'm a, I am a fan of Instagram. I do enjoy that. But I, I love the fact, and I do know you were early on doing this and talking about like strategy and how you put that together, right? It's one thing just to put pictures yeah. up, but it's another thing to say, you know, hey, what am I, what is the purpose of this? Like, what are my goals? Right. Right? What are you doing with it? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's awesome. You're putting something up there, but like, what is the intent? And I think we do that, obviously, now with my blog. When we were first, when I first started writing, it was just a writing to write. Like, there was no intent. Now yeah. I look at keywords and figure out, hey, which ones can I monetize? And there's a, there's a, a strategy to it, right? And if not, yeah. then it's just, you're just putting stuff out there. Yeah. Awesome. So, and how long have you been on Instagram for? How many years? I guess it's coming up on seven because I started Jen's Trends in 2013. Wow. And it was within three or four months that I kind of jumped on the Instagram bandwagon. So it's probably been almost exactly seven years. That's crazy. Yeah, man. It's time. Right? Yeah. Good, good platform to pick. Instagram's not going anywhere last time I checked. That was the funny thing. Like, again, it was totally like, you know, like the whole Snapchat thing. And we had all the Snapchat experts and now there's the TikTok things. And you know, everyone like, again, I didn't jump on the bandwagon with any yeah. sort of intention, but everyone's like, wow, you really hitched your wagon to the right post on that, didn't you? And I was like, I wasn't that, planning on it. it part of my journey. Happened. This is what we do. This is exactly. part of the journey. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's awesome. So in regards to Instagram, so let's talk about that a little bit. So what tools would you recommend for Instagram for people that let's say you're a business what tools are you currently using? Do you use, once again, maybe for clients, but also for your own profile? So I don't use a lot of tools, mm. partially because in order for me to know what's happening on Instagram, I have to be natively in the app doing all the things. If I'm relying on external editing tools, if I'm relying on external publishing tools, then I'm not in the app and I'm not like, oh, look, they changed that button or, oh, they moved this thing. So for me, I just do almost everything 100% natively, but I do obviously use some other tools. Personally, for me, I am a, a brand ambassador for Agora Pulse, and I use them for all my social media, like management side of things. Even just like, for example, when I get swamped, if I speak at an event, I'll get swamped with notifications and I can't keep up with them on Instagram because there's too many and they like, they exceed the amount of notification options. Mm -hmm but I can catch up on those on Agora Pulse. So I can go in and make sure that I didn't miss people like, you know, at mentioning me or those sorts of things. So I'll use that. I also love Tailwind and Icona Square mm -hmm. for dashboard management, analytics, those sorts of things, because they're very specific to Instagram. And so yeah. they're not kind of filtering in a bunch of other things. In terms of like editing tools, the one that I live and die by is PhotoFy, which is P-H-O-T-O-F-Y. Because I use that one to do text layovers on images and it has my branded font, which is hard to find. Yeah. So I was, and it's native in that app. And I was like, great. Now I can put all my branded content out there and not have to worry about it. So that was a huge advantage for me, but it is a great tool for doing like collages and putting like layovers or editing things like that. So I've been using that for years. I've been using that one. But that's pretty much all I really use. That's it. Well, and shout out to Mike and those guys over at Agora Pulse. That's a, right? a, a solid little team over there you guys got for sure. They are amazing. And that's not to like turn into like an Agora Pulse shout out party. But I mean, half the reason I love their company is because of the people behind the company. Like yeah. I love the tool. I love what they do. But it is like when you need help, they're there. Like if you need something, they will jump on a call. Like I've had multiple people say, well, I'd love to see how the tool works for me. And I'm like, great, let me introduce you to the sales team. They'll give you a private demo. And they're like, really? And I'm yeah. like, absolutely. Like they really just go above and beyond on the customer service aspect, which to me is, you know, miles ahead of most of their competitors. So that's so cool. And then it will also make it so they'll be stable in a, in a difficult economy, right? Which is going to probably happen here in the next few months, regardless of recession. Right which is, by the way, <laughs> we're in the middle of that. Or in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's awesome. When you do onboarding and when you really care about people, who yeah. cares if it's a $50 a month, you know, client, the thing is, is that's how you'll be able to sustain long-term, right? Is, you know, exactly. how you treated people during the good times and now during the bad times, you know, hopefully people will stay around and, and stick with the software, but it all, it comes down to, you know, what are you doing to be memorable, right? And to be able to, yeah. to, to care about people. So I think that's awesome. I know a group, like I said, I use a group of too. So I'm not nice. an ambassador, but I definitely like Mike and those guys and they do yeah. an awesome job over there. So we'll definitely give those guys a shout out. So I have another question and I want to, you know, I want to talk about Instagram some more, but the biggest question that I have as I look at this is how do you do everything? Like, right? Like I'm like, you've got a little angel over there. I think I'll <laughs> talk about her like 16 more times, but between that and, you know, the new this, and you've got your, you know, boyfriend, you've got this. And I'm like, I mean, how do you keep up with everything? Because I mean, are you just really good at like managing time? Yes. Okay. Like phenomenal. Because <laughs> you've got a full-time job too. Yeah. Literally. I could have told you that. Like I didn't even, I don't even know why I asked you. I should have just said, let me tell you what your superpower <laughs> is. And you could have been like, yes. And I get a full eight hours of sleep every night because mama does not function on no sleep. See, like, now I, you're... 
Now you're just I know, bragging. I'm gloating. Now I'm you're just bragging. <laughs> we didn't. I didn't have to take it there because I thought for sure I was going to ask you because I thought for sure you're probably on maybe two and a half hours sleep. I mean, you look amazing. Not not you don't. Well, look thank amazing. you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I was just thinking she's got to have like sixteen cups of coffee. Like I no, and I don't drink coffee. Jesus Christ, what is going on here? I mean, you drink wine, so we are good. We're still really we good drink, friends. I do drink was... wine. And I rely on soda. Soda is my caffeine source. So okay. that, is, that is my downfall. I okay. do still rely on caffeine to get through the day. Okay. I almost pinched myself. I was like, I really have a problem because I'm like coffee, <laughs> trying to get eight hours of sleep. Like it just doesn't, nothing ever goes together. Like I don't need coffee okay. in the morning. I'm just addicted in the summer. And that's, that's what I do. But... Yeah. No, I trust me. I totally get it. Um, and, but yeah, it's, for me, it really is time management. Like I've been doing, I still have my full-time day job. I run a full-time side business as Jen's Trends. I travel and speak and do all these things. I do have my daughter, you know, single mom, but I am lucky that I do have a good co-parenting relationship with her dad. And we split like about, I probably have about 60. He is 40 right now, percent of time. But so I've been able to say when I don't have her, I work and it's Jen's Trends. It's up late. It's, you know, working till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. It's finishing all those big projects so that when I have her, I'm not turning around being like, wait, 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 I got to go work on this. And mama's got to finish an email and I can give her the attention that I want to give her and I enjoy it more and then go back to working when I don't have her. So I've just kind of figured and, and learned over the years, like the schedule that works for me. I'm really bad about having availability on my calendar. People will call me for a consultation and I'm like, I got time in three months. And they're like, nothing sooner. Nope. <laughs> Cause I only have so many time slots I can fill without driving myself crazy and still managing everything. So I only have a couple time slots on a Friday. And once those book up the next one, you know, is, and it kind of keeps going down. So I do the best I can to keep my schedule as balanced as possible for me, but there's always, you know, flux and obviously the current state that we're in yeah. um, with all the coronavirus stuff is really throwing a monkey wrench into my life. <laughs> Man. Not having my kid in school and having her home with me. And, you know, normally I do her podcast and there's no child in the background dumping her Legos in the room next door. It adds character. It adds character to the podcast. We right? appreciate it. But yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, because you just have to be, I mean, because of, I know you obviously, but I mean, just yeah. the, the stuff that you've done in the past and like where you're at today, it's like you just have to, I mean, do you have, how big is your team? Like your team that you have? Me, literally, me just you. See, now you're out literally of hand. It. You have just you are out of pocket and out of hand. You need, and you're getting eight hours of sleep. God, you're like super. I'm gonna maybe be like seven you on a bad night, but yeah, like seven to eight hours. I go to bed at like nine o'clock. I get up at like five o'clock, four thirty ish, depending. Get up, get her ready, drop her off at school when she's in school, and then I go to work at the day job. And I'm home from the day job by four o'clock in the afternoon. So we have early hours. We do like a seven to three thirty. So I'm able to get home. I can jump on a client call at four o'clock, four thirty, or record a podcast or record a couple of videos or those types of things that I need to do. So it's like I said, I've just kind of worked the schedule in a way that I've learned what works and how to manage the time and expectations. But yeah, it's it's definitely, I mean, this is seven years in the making. Like it's not like I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, look at me successfully managing a calendar. It's and every time there's in like she was not in preschool and then she went to preschool. So it was like, now is a shift in the calendar. And that took me a good month to adjust to all of that. And I had, you know, breakdowns and crying and freaking out and this isn't going to work. And, but you know, a month is usually what we take to figure things out. And after a month, I was like, okay, we've got this, like we can move forward. So we all, you know, do the best we can. Yeah. You're doing an awesome job. Kudos to that. I mean, I just, I'm always interested in that because, you know, there's, I mean, I have a lot going on, but I have a 35 yeah. person team. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, you're like, when you're like, I do it by myself. And I'm like, so your <laughs> payroll's really low is what I'm getting at, what I'm trying to figure out. You're right. So, and now I get it. There's upsides and downsides of that, right? Like I can take on, I can do the real estate and do this and do that and do that because I have, yeah. you know, people you that have do a team. that. Yeah. But it's, I also look at that and go, man, that's just like, if you're able to manage all of that and manage your time, and especially with the once again, little angel that you have over there. I just, it's amazing. I mean, I just think that's awesome. It's just cool that you're able to do that. But I could, I could tell that obviously like anything else, it does take time. But once you get that yeah. in place, it's like, now you've got a good system in place. And obviously with family yeah. being first and you know, and all that, I really respect you for that. Cause it's, it could become a situation where, and we've all been there where, Hey, you're doing Saturday meetings or you're, you're switching with your daughter, but you're doing this, you're doing that. You've allocated time for that, which I think is important. A hundred percent. And that's always been my commitment to her, like that she comes first. And the reality is I work and I have the full-time side business because this is what I need to do to sustain my lifestyle and give her what she needs as a lifestyle. 
I could pull back on Jen's trends and not have the luxuries and things that I choose to have. Yeah. And she wouldn't get all the passes to all the Southern California theme parks. And she wouldn't get to go to all the amazing trips yeah. we get to do. Yeah. But those are my choices. And I choose to work to the level I do to sustain that lifestyle. But yeah, at some point, you know, there are times where you pull back. There's points where I will lean on other people to help with things. I am getting to the point where I'm like, I, my plan in 2020, we'll see now, you know, now the world's in chaos. Yeah. My plan this year was to hire a VA in order to start offloading some of those projects and expand my bandwidth. So, you know, there's always room for growth and, and learning curves. But yeah, for right now, it, it's all up in the air and who knows what will happen three months from now. So. <laughs> and how is it seeing your boyfriend twice a year? Is that, is that working right. out good for you? I'm assuming that he can't it's, be in the picture right. too much. <laughs> Nothing against your boyfriend, but I'm like, he's like, hey, can I come over? You're like, listen, you have four minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the funny thing is like, he travels a lot for his job too. Like, ah. I mean, he travels not obviously right now with coronavirus, but he travels at least once a month for his job because they have offices in 16 countries and he has to go visit all these different offices. So there are times where we will, we have never, I don't think we've ever gone more than two weeks without seeing each other. Mm. But I mean, he lives here in the same city and we can literally be in the same city and go 10 days without seeing each other just because of his schedule, my schedule, travel, all the different things we've got going on. But we, I mean, we'll Zoom call, you know, we, you know, we text all day, every day. So we find ways to kind of stay in contact as best as possible. And, and then when we get together, we don't have any of the drama and we don't have any, you know, we just get to enjoy being together because we don't, we're not tied at the hip all the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I hear you. Another thing is too, I will tell you with the VA thing, we're talking about hiring a VA. Let me know when you do that. Cause I've, I've hired a lot of VAs and I've got a yeah. solid system. In fact, I'll probably one day I'll do a course, probably 2000, maybe, maybe this year, since I'm going to have all kinds right? of time, I got time. Stuck, it, stuck at the mouse. Hopefully I won't be like drunk on the videos. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we are. How to hire a VA. But <laughs> But seriously, if you ever need some help with that, reach out to me because I have good Thank processes you. in place with hiring people. I've got it down to a science because I, you know, hired thousands, not thousands, but hundreds, and then I got it down to a good thing. So I'll just I'll throw that That's out awesome. to you if yeah, you. when you get the time. So it is helpful. I tell you, I have a personal VA that like has changed my life in the sense of yeah. the training was over. I mean, I did an hour a day for probably three months, but yeah. it's all I've got it all documented. He's got all these no, I mean, there are templates. It's just it's a beautiful thing. That's right awesome. Now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been. Shout out to Ian. Ian, hopefully you're going to hear this here, buddy. Um, so cool. Let's talk a little bit about strategy because I want to talk a little bit about Instagram with businesses and stuff like that. I mean, we always see... I think the biggest thing is that businesses get... you know, that's, They always see the new platform and want to jump on the new platform. Like, What about Instagram? Do you feel like all businesses should be on Instagram? Or what are your, what are your thoughts about that? So this is... I, and I always love this question. I always say any business can be on Instagram. Not every business should. Should. Yeah, yeah. So anybody can. And I've seen the most bizarre businesses be massively successful on Instagram. Um, obviously, from my forensics background, there's a woman who is a coroner. And she has an incredibly successful Instagram account as a coroner. And you're like, why? The TSA, the people who literally make you take your shoes off at the airport, incredibly successful on Instagram. And they're actually one of my favorite Instagram accounts. But it's, you know, it can be done. If you do it the right way and you have the right strategy and you have the audience there, it absolutely can work. But for some people, especially, you know, smaller businesses, people pulled in multiple directions, you can't be everywhere mm. and you have to pick and choose. So maybe your choice based on your audience is that you're going to be over on Facebook and LinkedIn. Great. Go do that. Don't try to add Instagram if you don't have the bandwidth. If you are the solopreneur and you're trying to do it all and there's only so many hours in the day and you've got family and responsibilities... Don't go and add another platform that's going to take up you know, another 10 hours of your week. Yeah. So you have to think logically in terms of who you are as a business, what kind of content you have. I'm the first person to be a huge proponent of B2B businesses on Instagram, which most people don't think about. They think Instagram is very B2C. And of course, inherently it is. Pretty pictures, sell a product. But you can absolutely be a B2B and I'm a huge proponent of that. But it has to be the right fit for you. It has to be something that is something easy for you to create that content. It has to be something that your audience is there and is willing to accept that type of content. And now Instagram has over a billion monthly active users. So your audience is there. There's more people over the age of 45 on Instagram than are over there on Twitter. So if, you, if your audience is on Twitter, I promise you they're probably on Instagram too. But are they there for the right reasons? Are they looking for what you have to offer? Maybe, maybe not. And it, you just kind of have to find the right place I always use the example of car insurance because I'm like, you know, no one's going to go to Instagram to find car insurance, right? Like that's 
And people are like, oh, well, I can't use it. And I'm like, absolutely, you can if you do it well. And I have a friend here in San Diego, Jacob Sapochnik, who is an immigration lawyer. And he's incredibly successful on Instagram, showcasing his business, his industry, you know, giving advice, showcasing his employees, building a trust factor, showcasing his family so that people know and respect him. Hugely successful as a lawyer. Would you normally think that could be successful? Maybe not. So you really have to just dig into like, again, like who you are, what your goals are and who your audience is. And then you have to just figure out how to use Instagram strategically for that end goal and not using it as a sales pitch, not using it as a constant, you know, sell, sell, sell. No one's going to look for you for car insurance, but they'll look for you for education and car information. And you have the ability to provide. I love that. So your, your buddy that's immigration, what was it? Jacob? Yeah. So Jacob, so would you consider him to be like kind of an influencer or is it more just like, I mean, he's an influencer in, in that space that he's kind of been a thought leader or is it more that he puts out good content and people like his content? I mean, it's a little of both. He's actually spoken at m- numerous conferences because mm-hmm. he was so successful in doing what he did to build his brand on Instagram that a lot of people have had him speak at conferences about how to use Instagram as a lawyer or in that type of industry. So in that way, he is kind of an influencer, but really he's built his business. He gets clients every day, every week that find him on Instagram and hire him as an immigration attorney. So it's he's not getting the revenue and income for being successful on Instagram. He's getting it for doing his business and, and building a brand that people respect and want to work with them. And trust. Yeah. So I have another question. So this is, and this is always the age old question. If I get a dollar for every time somebody asked me this in an interview or, or an influencer got a hold of me, but what about the infamous algorithm of Instagram and the, you know, everybody, you can tell when something's happening because it's everybody's up in arms like, Oh God, right. I've lost. I used to get a thousand likes and now, or whatever, you know, I used to get 800 <laughs> comments and now I get 42. Like, what am I going to kill myself? And it's like, don't kill yourself because then you can't put anything else on Instagram. Like that's a right, exactly. stop. Like you, you really want to survive. And we can't survive. listen to you complain. Yeah, because we love this. We love seeing a little tantrum, a little, a little, you freaking out on Instagram. That'll get the views up. Just go ahead and lose your mind. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So how do you, I mean, I mean, I have my own answer for this, but how do you, would you recommend combating the, the age old instant, you know, the algorithm that seems to yeah. attack people on a daily basis? So, and in full disclosure, I actually have a video on my YouTube channel that says, did the Instagram algorithm change? And basically long and short of is it, no, it did not. Usually it's you (laughs) is the problem. And now that's not to say the algorithm doesn't change because it does. But the algorithm as a whole pretty much hasn't changed for the last three years. They're constantly tweaking things in the background. Can that have an impact on you? Of course. Can things go up and down? Of course. But a lot of times what happens when people think there's been an algorithmic change is more likely they've actually been flagged for spam or inappropriate content, which horrible, mean, you know, non-Canadian people will just be rude and just tag you with spam for no good reason. But some people will think that your content is poorly formatted. Um, They will flag you for because they genuinely feel like you're spamming them. Some people will do it just to be plain old mean. And once you've been flagged, you don't know you've been flagged. You don't get a notification that says somebody reported you for spam, but all of a sudden you're basically an Instagram jail. And like you said, you're not getting any likes. You're, you know, all of a sudden this huge drop off. That's usually a major contributing factor. Other times there have been shifts where, you know, things will change and content that was working really well before isn't working well now, just because of the type of content that the artificial intelligence is looking for, whether you're showing up in hashtag searches or not, that's going to have an impact. Again, if you've been flagged, you're not going to show up in searches. So no one's going to see fresh content from you unless they're already following you. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of different things at play, but I always tell people, if you feel like your content has dropped off, because I get conversation all the time and I will give me your Instagram handle. All right. I go look and I'm like, I will take an average of their last 10 days or their last 10 posts and see their average engagement. Then I go look at the next 10. Then I go look at the next 10 and I'm like, your engagement hasn't dropped. Like an average across 10, across 10, across 10, it's almost identical. They just feel like their, you know, their engagement is dropping. Additionally, if your followers are growing, your engagement will actually drop as a ratio. So when you had a hundred followers, they loved you, right? All 100 of them liked everything and you had a crazy good engagement. You got to a thousand. Now you're like kind of a bunch of casual users, people who don't log in every day. So you're not going to have the same percentage of people liking your content because you have more casual followers, people who are less likely to interact with your content consistently. And as you continue to grow, that happens. So with a small following, you may have had 10% engagement. 
as you grow, now your engagement's down to, you know, three, four percent, and you you feel like you've dropped off, but really it's just because the followers you have are not targeted followers. They're not dedicated. They're not logging in consistently. I fall victim to this because people see me speak at a conference. I get 200 new followers in, in that day. And then maybe 50% of them don't log back into Instagram for another month. So I have this huge influx in new followers, but no influx in new engagement because they're not logging in to see my content. Those bastards. Right? Yeah. I'm like, you're going to follow me. You better show up. Just being, I'm just being honest. <laughs> you guys are bastards for that, by the way, but okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. My content is amazing. I know. You will love it. <laughs> you will enjoy it and you will check in every day. And you will like it. That's right. But it is, there's, there's all these different things that are always at work. And I tell people, you know, one of the first things you can look at is what is your actual engagement rate? Has it really dropped off? Then go and look at your posting frequency. The way the algorithm works is if you are posting every single day, you are literally competing with your own content for placement. So if I'm a casual follower of yours, I will not see all of your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday posts. I will see your Wednesday post. So I will not see your other four posts because the algorithm is choosing how much to show me higher in the feed. And for the record, Instagram does not hide any content. Facebook hides stuff. Instagram just simply resorts it. If you scroll far enough back, it's all there. But if your content is falling lower and lower in my feed, I'm only going to see one of your five posts. There goes your... If you'd only posted once that week, then all of us would have seen that one post and your engagement on that one post would be exponentially higher because it wouldn't be filtered out across all that content. So if you feel like you're dropping an engagement, look at your posting frequency, potentially slow it down, go down to two times a week instead of five times a week, something like that. But also look at your content. It has to stand out in the feed. People have to literally stop the scroll to like it, to comment, to click, to share to a story, whatever it is. And if they're not seeing that content, then it's going to rank lower and lower and they're not going to get engagement. And then additionally, if you're putting a lot of effort into your stories, stories are mutually exclusive from the feed. So if you're putting all this effort into your stories and you're getting a lot of stories views, but you're like half-assing your feed content, now your feed content isn't going to represent the fact that if someone likes all your your stories, they're not going to see your feed any higher. So if you're kind of half-assing that content, it starts ranking lower and lower and lower because people aren't interacting with it. Well, now you're not going to have any engagement. So there's all these components that tie in that you really have to, again, get strategic with where you're going, what the end goal is, how do you want to get there, and how do you create the content that serves that end goal for you? And so when we talk about Instagram jail, would you make the assumption that when you get an Instagram jail, you don't know that you're in Instagram jail? It's kind of like getting the coronavirus these days, right? It's kind of like the same thing where you... You're in this quarantine. (laughs) And you don't even know, right? You're like, wait a second. Oh, no, wait. We are. We are. Okay, we are quarantined. So we do know now. Okay, good. I was worried that Instagram jail was equivalent to what just happened here in California. So no, we're good. A little different, but kind of the same. It really kind of is though, because you won't know until all of a sudden you don't get engagement or you can't comment on somebody's post. Or you can't send a DM and you're like, oh, I must have been put in jail. And first time offenses, 12 to 24 hours and you get out of jail. Repeat offenses start going into multiple days, three to five days, seven days, to the point of eventually shutting down your account, not being able to do anything. So if you've been put in jail, again, you probably won't know why. But look at your content. Was it, you know, the types of hashtags you were using? Were you showing up in searches that could have been associated with spam type content? Was there something in your messaging that could have been considered spammy or inappropriate? Were you overdoing the DMs, sending way too many DMs, or it was a copy and paste? Because you'll be put in jail for that. So you really do want to look and see. But if you're a first time or like casual offender, it's usually 12 to 24 hours. So this is what I like. Have you ever thought maybe being an Instagram attorney? Because I like that. You're like, your first offense is going to be 12 to 24 hours, Shane. And I'm like, okay, that's, I mean, I just won't do it again. Your second offense though, Shane, if you do that again, that's going to be uh, three to five days. And then at this yeah. point, you'll not get any food. There's no commissary. I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds good. I feel like you were like an attorney there a second. I was like, I definitely want to get three. So Shane, if you get three, just, you know, an Instagram jail. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. That sounds terrible. I definitely don't want to go. Okay. Then you need to clean your act up. Okay. You need to get on there and do some different stuff. I will. I promise you. And I just, yeah. hopefully we don't have to have to talk again. Cause I just do not want to. Right. I don't want to see you back in my courtroom. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like I've had that conversation before. It's so weird. Well, shoot. We're, I mean, this is once I've said this before, this is the difficult part. It's been an hour. And I know for you, right? you're like, listen, if we go three minutes over, then that's going to cut into other things. I know we mama runs a tight ship. 
And we get that. I, I get <laughs> yeah. that 100%. I'm going to ask you one last question. So if you could have dinner with three people, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Because I'm always intrigued on who people pick. It kind of gives me a little, you know, a little intel on people. So the first one I would pick would be my best friend. Mm. Amanda Robinson, who is at the digital gal. And she's a Facebook ads expert because all my friends work in social media, but she, she's my best friend. I love her to death and we don't get to see each other nearly enough Mm. um, because she lives in Canada. I live in San Diego. So we, we try to see each other every two months, but right now I don't know when I'll get to see her again. So she would be the first person because I just want to have my best friend. Second person would be Bethany Frankel from Real Housewives of uh, New York. And she's had her own spinoff shows she has the whole skinny girl brand. And I just uh-huh. am fascinated by her as a mom, as a human being, as a woman, as a business owner. She's launched her own nonprofit called Be Strong. And she does so much to help, you know, like after hurricanes and things that like, like in Puerto Rico and all these sorts of things. And I just, I'm so fascinated by her, but she's also kind of a little crazy, like kind of my level of just crazy enough to be crazy, but not like certifiably crazy. Mm, mm, <laughs> I feel like we would just have ride. some amazing, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I hear you. Like the conversations, I'm just like, I know her and I would just like have the best time. And then because I'm like obsessed with the Royals, I would love to sit down with Meghan Markle. I would love to understand the transition that everything she went through. I've been a fan of hers since she's before she was on Suits even, but all the years on Suits. And then having her transition to the Royal family and everything that came with that and motherhood and everything. Now they're living on Vancouver Island, like in the town, like the city where I'm from. So I like have all these like eyes to, Hmm. you know, I just love to know how those transitions worked and, and how they're adjusting to everything. So I think that would be a really fascinating conversation to have. I got interviewed about that. Like when they decide to break off from being Royals mm-hmm. and that, I like had two big publications. that got a hold of me like instantly. I was like, what do you think's happening? Wait, had this? And we had this big old interview about that. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's like, I mean, I get it. Right. I mean, it's, it's a hard situation when you go from being, you know, a celebrity and then you go to being yeah. like a mega celebrity where you're like, you can't do anything without being this. And there's a different protocol with being royalty. Last time I checked, I've never been royalty and I probably won't be this, this right? lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> but from what I've heard, all my royalty friends have told me that. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of how I get it. So Jen, if anybody needs to get in contact with you, is interested in consulting. I know you're about seven years out because you're just too busy with everything. <laughs> but if, if somebody was like, God, I'll, I'll pay any amount of money to work with Jen, how can they get in contact with you? So the best place to find me, obviously, is my website, jenstrends.com. It's Jen with two N's. So J-E-N-N-S trends.com. You can find me on Instagram at Jen's underscore trends. Again, two N's. And join my Facebook group. That's a great place to hang out with me. If you just search Jen's trends in social media, you'll find both the Facebook page and the Facebook group. But the group is where I share all breaking news related to Instagram, any big social media news and update. Everything goes in the Facebook group first, and then I go and share it other places. So it's a great place to stay on top of everything. It's a super active group where people ask questions and get help. And I'm always there to help with those simple little questions. But then obviously, yes, hit me up on the on the website or shoot me an email, jen at jenstrends.com if you're interested in you know, working with me as a consultant, if you want me to post a webinar or speak at an event, any of those sorts of things, that's where I love to shine and, and help you and your team be successful with all the training that I do. I don't know how you keep up with everything. You've, I, you've, I'm officially lost my mind. I'm, I'm going to go fire. I'm going to go fire 34 people right now, just because of you. thank you so much for motivating me on being being a solo for near and knocking it out of the park. So you guys, if, if you guys like this podcast and like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to it. And Jen, this was awesome. Once again, we've, we've talked a few times offline and even online, but I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know a busy day to being on the podcast today. And we're looking forward to, I'll let you know when we, we put all the content out and when yeah. I said, we'll send it to you and, and so you can share it with your audience. Can't wait. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye everybody.